Hey, so glad you have joined us for worship today. And real quick, before we get started, um, go grab something for communion. We are going to celebrate that together at the end of the service. So grab some bread or crackers and juice or wine, whatever you need to celebrate at the end of the service. And if you are ready, let's go join Charlie and the band for worship. Good morning. Welcome to Community. My name is Charlie. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us from wherever you're watching. Let's worship God through song. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King among us, let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, my. 
Hi, I'm Shelly, Creative Arts Pastor, and I'm so glad that you joined us today. Now listen, I have so many exciting things that I want to tell you about and that you, the online campus, can totally be a part of. So the first thing I want to say is the Thanksgiving Meal Co-op. You guys, we do this every year. It's a really, it's a big deal. It's one of our favorite things to do. We are going to provide 200 complete meals for families in need this Thanksgiving. And I want to show you just how easy it is to sign up and help. Go to communitychristianchurch.com. Up at the top, click Contribute. And then Thanksgiving Meals Co-op. And it's going to pop up in a page with all of this. And you have a printable list that you can print out for your shopping. And you can fill this out with your information. Let us know how many meals that you want to donate. Um, You can do as many as you want. And then if you don't want to shop, click here and we will do it for you. All you got to do is fill out this information. It's a special holiday offering. You put Thanksgiving co-op if you want. And it's $50 will cover one entire meal. So you can give as many of those as you want. Uh, Finish filling out your information. Hit submit. And then you have done it. You have participated in the Thanksgiving co-op. And we are so thankful. So Sunday, November 22nd is Contribute Sunday. And along with all those Thanksgiving meals going out, we are asking you as community to go and do something to make a difference. If you're local and you want to join a group that's doing a a project, we have several COVID-friendly projects that you could jump in on. Um, We are going to work with an organization in town that are painting wheelchair ramps outside and they're going to have all the materials and stuff. So that would be a cool project for you and your family. Uh, Hope's Closet, this local organization that's an amazing, amazing place. They're going to have a lot of opportunities for donations and for help sorting clothes and, and all kinds of jobs. So that's something else that you could do. And also, you guys, wherever you are, you can help somebody. Maybe you just need to help a neighbor. Maybe you help the person in the apartment next to you. Or maybe you rake your neighbor's leaves and, and just, just surprise somebody. Maybe you take treats to uh, someone that you miss seeing or, or of firefighters or something like that. So there's all kinds of ways that you can help, that you can make a difference. We wanted you to be part of that and let us know what you're doing. That's so cool. And also, hey, right after Thanksgiving, you know, is Christmas. So we are working already on developing our When Christmas Goes Sideways series. And we think you're really gonna enjoy it. We're having fun with it. But we need to hear your stories. Do you have a year that you had some, I don't know, just some little Christmas mishap? Something just went a little crazy, went a little wrong, and you remember it every year. You're like, oh, I remember that year. I wanna hear those stories. So think about that story. And then grab your phone, turn it this way, and film yourself telling me that story and then send it to me, Shelly at communitychristianchurch.com as soon as possible. I need them all by the end of the month because we're going to start that series at the beginning of December. So that's exciting. And then we have this other really exciting project. You guys, it's the Christmas shop. We did this for the first time last year and we had so much fun. This is an opportunity for parents of families in need to still give their kids Christmas presents themselves. So here's what we do. We get lists of toys and clothes and things that kids want, things that kids need. We go and we buy all the items, we bring them back here unwrapped, and then we've set up a shop. And we're working with a local elementary school and some local organizations, and we're all pulling in together to do this. And the parents come in and they're able to pick out toys and clothes that are just right for their kid they wrap them and they put them under their own tree. And you guys, that is something special. And there are gonna be ways for you as an online campus to participate in that. So watch for that, because that's coming up really soon. And then here's another big thing that's coming up soon. Um, Sunday, December the 6th, we are going to be starting some new times. We're adding a service back. So at the township, we will have a nine o'clock worship service in person. Masks will be required and no childcare available at that one. But if that's a good fit for you, we've got that. And then a 1030 in-person service at Fairfield Township and masks are encouraged. So those two in-person services, Trenton will still be at 10 o'clock Sunday mornings 
That's a video venue with a live host. And then online campus, we're not changing your time. You are still at 10 o'clock. But if any of those service times work for you, we would love to have you with us, however you're with us, your community. And listen, don't forget, you are part of community. And so we love that you continue to partner with us to reach out and make all these differences. One of those ways is your online giving. It makes a big difference, more than you realize. So easy ways to do that. You can um, go on the website, click giving. You can give electronically. You can text to give. You can mail it in. Whatever you want to do, we are appreciative and we're glad that you are working alongside us. And now, if you're ready, grab your Bibles your Uversion apps, go ahead and pop those open to First Peter and you'll be ready for Scott as he continues our series on different. Hey, I am so glad that you tuned in with us today because I mean, you know, it's been such a rough year for some of us. And for some of us, it's been a rough month or maybe a rough couple of weeks or maybe just a rough few days this past week. And, 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 and for a lot of us, you know, this whole political thing has really taken a toll on our lives. And, and no matter where you fall on the whole political spectrum, I want you to know that I've been praying that God gives all of us some peace and some rest and some hope through everything going on in our lives right now. For some of you, you're really, really worried and you're stressed about the election results. And in case no one has told you this yet, thank you for being worried. Thank you for caring enough to, to put yourself out there and talk about your concerns and your beliefs and your values and what's important to you. Thank you for that. I am grateful that you're passionate enough about our country to want to talk about those types of things. But can I ask you to, to please hold on to, to just this one thought as we finish out the rest of this political process, and that's this, God is in control. And if you don't know that, you need to know that. The, the, the results of this election is not a surprise to God. He, he already knew. He isn't sitting in heaven going, I can't believe this. I don't know how this guy won. How did that guy lose? I don't know. I, I thought I had it figured out, but I guess I just didn't. No, God, God's sitting in heaven going, I, I know who wins because it's already part of his plan. It's already part of the process that God put into place, and the thing is working exactly how God designed it to work. Now, when you look at everything, uh, when it comes to the whole political spectrum, here's the thing that we need to hold on to again. Our role in this political process is to love God and love people. Love them enough that someone's viewpoint that's different than your viewpoint doesn't hold you back from loving them and serving them and supporting them and caring for them. Our attitudes and our actions really fit into this series that we're going through on the, the, the book of First Peter. If you missed last week, um, Joel talked about the fact that, that Peter was writing to a group of people that were being persecuted somewhere between 60 and 65 A.D., and Peter wrote this book during the time of this evil emperor named Nero. And Nero is causing all sorts of problems, not just for Christ followers, but really for everyone in his kingdom. Now, don't miss this. God worked through Nero just like he'll work through whoever our president is. That's what God does. Nero burned down part of his own city to build a new palace, which they told him he wasn't allowed to build anything new, so he was out there to get his way. And and when he did that, he then blamed the Christ followers as the ones that burned down part of the city, when it was really his idea and his actions that, that made that, that, that fire happen. And that made a bad environment for the Christ followers even worse. And so it gave Nero this excuse to, to persecute the Christ followers. So he would do things like wrap Christ followers in animal skins and throw them into a pit of hungry dogs, bears, lions, whatever he had available. He would, he, he would throw a Christ followers up against, against gladiators, and, and people would watch that in the arena and watch gladiators just destroy the Christ followers. One story talks about Nero actually impaling 
Christ, Christ followers where they were alive, impaling them on sticks and then setting them on fire while they were still alive. Just horrible, horrific kinds of things. Peter wrote to those persecuted Jesus followers to try to give them some hope because they needed some hope, and it's also written to us because we need some hope. He keeps telling them and telling us again and again and again, this world is not your home. You're just passing through. This world is not your home because this world is only a temporary existence for us in the entire lifespan of who we are. This world's not our ending place. It's not our finished place. This world's not our home. And because this world is not our home, God is calling us to be different while we're here, to live different kind of lives. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you're called to be different in a lot of different things. First of all, you're going to have different values. Now, that's an important thing to think about. We're going to have different passions. We're going to have a different use of our time as Christ followers, just different than everyone else. We're going to have a different use of our resources than somebody that doesn't know Jesus. We're going to be different as a parent and different as a spouse and different in the way that we work. All those things will be different if you're a Christ follower, or they should be. And if they're not, that's something that we have to take a good hard look at because God is calling us to be different now, if you have your Bibles or your version apps, we open them to the book of 1 Peter, and we're going to look at chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. And here it is. It says this, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Another version puts that ending like this. It says, live out your time as temporary residents. This isn't your final place. This world's not your home. You have a different home. You're just passing through. You have a higher calling, and God wants you to be different while you're here. The problem with so many people in our culture, and the problem with so many of us listening today, right now, is, is this. The biggest obstacle to us fully following Christ is our desire to fit in. That's why we don't do it. We don't want to be on the outside. Nobody wants to be made fun of. Nobody wants to be not accepted into whatever circle of friends that you want to be a part of. We want to look and act like everyone else around us. That's just true for us. Anyone fall into the, the, the clothes name game where you had to have the right designer clothes and you had to wear the right shoes and the right hat and the right shirt and the right jeans? I remember having to go... Um, the the when I was in junior high, the right color jams shorts. Remember jams? Yeah, you have to be my age to remember those things. But they had to be the right jams even to be able to wear. Um, I had to have the right Levi's jacket when I was in high school. And it's funny that my youngest son, Zach, has to have the right Levi's jackets to wear. And he has a closet full of them at this point. I had to have the right Converse shoes when I was in high school. Now, my wife, when she was growing up, they didn't have much money, and so they didn't have brand name clothes. They got hand-me-downs from friends and, and relatives kind of thing. So she bought a generic polo when she was in high school, and she cut the Izod off of an, an old Izod shirt that didn't fit her anymore, and she sewed it onto the new polo shirt that was generic just to fit in. Now, don't miss this, all right? Everyone, don't, don't miss this. God did not call you to fit in. God called you to stand out. Now, I know that's different, and it's more difficult at different stages in life where you have to try to fit in in different ways, but it's still true. God did not call you to fit in. He's called you to stand out. Anybody remember the Where, Where's Waldo books? And man, I, I used to love looking for Waldo. You had this guy with, with glasses wearing this red and white striped um, 
you know, hat and this red and white striped sweater. And somewhere in a picture with a few thousand normal people, Waldo was in the middle of all that. But he just didn't really stick out as much as he should have. He looked different than everyone else, but man, he was tough to find. Someone said this, where's Waldo has always struck me as a metaphor about how someone wearing such ridiculous clothing can be so hard to find. And when you finally find him, you can't lose him again. He's always just there sticking out to you on that page. I think we as Christ followers are tough to find in our culture. We should be sticking out, but we tend to just blend in. We tend to not stick out, not want to do anything different, not want to be ridiculed or put on the outside because of what we believe or how we live. And so we just blend in with the crowd. Romans 12, 2 says this. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Man, you, you, you've got to not conform to places, not conform to groups, not conform to the people around you. First Peter 1.14 again says this, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Now you've been transformed. We're never called to blend in. We just aren't. As Christ followers, we're called by God to stand out, to be set apart, to be different in the way that we live. Now, why do you want to be normal to begin with? Have you ever thought about that? Why do you want to be normal? Have you looked around to see what normal is? I mean, normal is, is broke, in debt up to your eyeballs. Normal is fear. Normal is divorce. Normal is tension. Normal is sleepless nights. Normal is anxiety. Normal is hating your job. That's what normal is. And to be honest, I don't want anything to do with what's normal. I want, I want off the normal road. I want to be different than that. I don't want to live that way, and I don't want you living that way either, because it's a horrible place to be. Matthew 7, 13 through 14 says this, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Friends, let's be the few. Let's not be the crowd. Let's be the people who walk the not normal kind of road. It's all your choice. You don't have to do one or the other, but if you choose to live the not normal way, I promise you, your life will be more outstanding than just blending in with the crowd. So how can you live in a way that's different from the people around you? How does that work? Well, take a good look at the majority of people around you. I mean, there's so much pain. There's so much hurt. There's so much anger and so much brokenness. And I've heard a lot of excuses about people not having to be different with their lives, but saying, I can be fine with Jesus and blend into the crowd. People say, I can do what I want, what I want to do. It's not going to bother me. It's not going to affect me in any way. I can watch what I want. I can say what I want. I can live how I want. I'm okay. Now, with all the people I've heard say that to me, and there have been a ton of people that have said those exact comments, deep down inside, we need to know how to be different than what we are because that's what we're all longing for. We're all longing for purpose. We're all longing for meaning in our lives. Why can't we find it? Because we're settling for being normal. That's why. Now, listen, if you think that you don't need to change... If that's you, then let me tell you this. You've already blocked Jesus out of your life. If you think you're fine, nothing needs to change in my life, you've already put him out to the side. If you're one of the people that say, this is just how I am and I don't need to change, then you've said, God, I don't need you because I've got my life under control. And yet your life is a mess. 1 Peter 1.14 again says this. 
As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. In other words, there was a time when you didn't know any better. That's true for all of us. And quite honestly, that's still where some of us are right now in our lives. We're doing some things that may not be the smartest things to do, but we just haven't learned yet. We haven't grown yet. We haven't been transformed by Jesus yet. There was a time when you weren't really accountable because you didn't know. And if you didn't know, how could you be accountable to that? But now you do know. Now you know what Jesus wants you to do. Now you know that that Jesus wants you to live in a different kind of way. So now it's time to pick up your game. Now it's time to change. Now it's time to be open to that change. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says this, Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. That's a challenge. That might be one of the un unaccomplishable type challenges out there. Be holy because I'm holy? Now, don't miss this. <coughs> don't miss this. It doesn't say what most of us want this to say, all right? It doesn't say uh, how we want this to read. It does not say, be happy in all you do because I am happy. That's what we want it to say. Be happy in all you do because I'm happy. That's what we want God to tell us. That's what we want God to do for us, especially in the United States version of Christianity. So many people in, in the United States believe that God's highest value and purpose for us is that we're happy. Here's the problem. Happiness is based on happenings, and happenings don't always make us happy. Sometimes happenings might be unhappy. Sometimes happenings might be downright sad. And we need to find the difference between happiness and joy. Because joy isn't based on what's happening around us. Joy is based on what Jesus has done for us. That's forgiveness and mercy and grace and salvation. Those things are always there for you. They just are. God will never leave you, but you can choose to leave God. And that's the sad part of the story. Those are always our choices. But God loves you, and he wants you to be holy. Now, God wants us to be happy, but it's not his priority. Happiness isn't what God plans for us. His priority for our lives is, again, that we're holy. Now, you need to hear this, and you need to feel this. God's highest calling for Christ followers is not our happiness. His highest calling is our holiness. How are you doing with that? Is your life all about searching for happiness, or is it about living with purpose and meaning and holiness? He's called us to be set apart, to be different. The problem with the theology of happiness or that God wants me to be happy above everything else, that philosophy, is it sets us up for these justifications for doing whatever we want to do. We think, well, <clears throat> if God wants me to be happy, then I can do something that might be wrong, but because God wants me to be happy, then that makes it okay. You ever been there? Have you lived that way at all? If God wants me to be happy, I'm not happy in my marriage then what do you do? Well, God wants me to be happy, so obviously I can walk out of this marriage anytime I decide to. Yeah, don't worry about the to death do us part for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer and sickness and the health part because I'm not happy, so I'm just leaving. Now, here's the deal. God's okay with that, right? Because he wants me to be happy. No, unless there's abuse, unless there's infidelity that's happened in your relationship, God says, stay, work on it, work it out. You made those commitments, see them through, work on the relationship. If I'm not happy because I don't have what I want, then what do we tend to do? We tend to go, well, I want this, I need this, this is going to make me happy, and if I have to beg, borrow, steal, or go into massive debt, that's okay because God wants me to be, to be happy. 
So God wants me to have this because we think it'll make us happy. Now, I'm in the middle of that right now. I know, just kind of the way it works for all of us. I decided to learn something new during COVID-19. So seven, eight months ago, I decided to learn how to play the guitar. Never played gu- the guitar before, maybe a little bit in junior high, but, but, but not much. And so I'm going, okay, I'm going to play the guitar. I'm going to learn this. And I didn't have a guitar. So I had to start searching for a guitar. And here was my thinking. If I get a really good guitar, that'll be a motivating factor to keep me playing and practicing. So I found a really nice Taylor acoustic guitar that was way more money than I should have ever thought about spending on a guitar. I mean, like way, way more money than I should have ever spent. But I bought it because I rationalized it. And I thought it was going to make me happy. And then after I had that, I started thinking, well, I need an electric guitar. So I started searching for a Telecaster. And I found a great one. And I made some great deals on it, a great trade on it. And then after I brought that home, I'm going, well, I need an amp. Because I can't play an electric guitar without an amp. So I found a great deal on an amp. And it's way more amp than I need. Matter of fact, if I turn it up, my whole house will probably collapse around me. It's that loud. But I bought it because I thought... It was going to make me happy. And then I thought, well, I need another electric guitar. I can't just have that kind of an amp for one guitar. So I bought another electric guitar. And now I'm having trouble stopping buying guitars. Because deep inside, I think they're going to make me happy. Now, I'm loving playing the guitar. But I keep rationalizing what I want because I think it's going to make me happy. And by the way, if you have any guitars sitting around in a closet or under the bed, no, don't, don't do that. Yes, no, yes. Yeah. I'm having trouble with this, all right? So, so help me out here. I'm struggling. Maybe for you, you think, you know what, I'm dating someone and we've been dating for a while and, and, and I know that we should wait till we're married before we have sex, but culturally it's okay these days and, and it's going to make me happy. And after all, we're in love and, and kind of we're, we're kind of married in our hearts because that's kind of where we think we are right now. And so it's going to make me happy, so that's what I'm going to do. And what all of this does is that it empowers us to justify our actions that for any other reason we would say that's wrong. But we justify it because we think it's going to make us happy. And when we believe that God's priority for us is to be happy, then everything else in our lives gets a little more cloudy. And then if there's a delay in your life, a risk, an inconvenience, something not going your way, none of that could possibly be God's will because God's will for you is that you're happy. And suddenly, without even knowing it, we begin to worship these false gods of comfort and money and pleasure and stuff because God's supposed to get me that stuff to make me happy, right? No. God doesn't exist to serve us. We exist to serve God. And he calls us to be set apart, to be holy, not to rationalize our decisions, but to be holy and live a different kind of lifestyle. So what does the word holy mean? It means to be pure. It it, it means to be different. Certainly, we don't see much holiness in our current culture. It means to be set apart. 1 Peter 1, 14 and 15 again says this. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. Don't slip back. Such an important statement right there. Don't slip back. Anybody realize that you can slip into trouble, but you never slip into righteousness? It just doesn't happen that way. I've heard people say, I fell into a sin. I've never heard anyone say, I fell into holiness. I mean, I didn't mean to fall into holiness. I'm I'm just holy. How'd that happen? I just got up and I was trying to sin, but, but holiness caught up with me and now I'm perfect. It doesn't happen that way. We have an enemy who will cause you to slip up, to trip, to fail. You need to understand that your enemy is subtle, he's sneaky, he's real. His name is Satan, the father of lies, the prince of darkness, and his mission is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's why he exists. Now, let me tell you, because he's sneaky and he's so subtle, he's not going to come up to you and say, hey, why don't you be a devil worshiper? Let's go kill some chickens in your garage. 
You know, that, that's not the way it's going to work. He doesn't do that. What he does is the same thing that he did all the way back in the very first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, where he talks to Adam and Eve, and he said, did your God really say, don't eat of the fruit of that tree? Did he really say, don't do that? Why would he even ask you not to do that? And he starts messing with our minds and putting doubt in our minds. Did God really say you're supposed to wait until you're married? Did God really say that you have to go to church and pray? Did God really say to forgive people? Did God really say not to listen to gossip? Did God say whatever it is? Satan wants to put that doubt in your mind and you start thinking, no, I'm, I'm good, I'm fine. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm good. I'm really not that bad. As a matter of fact, I'm a lot better than Jim is. I'm so much better than Sue is. I'm better than they are. And, and, and here's the point of this whole, this whole section. Other people aren't your measuring stick. It doesn't matter what somebody else is doing or what they're not doing. That's not even your business. You're not measured against them. You're measured against God and God's holiness. So how are you doing measuring yourself against God? God calls us as Christ followers to be different, to be set apart. I want to ask you just a couple questions as we're kind of coming to wrap this up right now. What's the one area that you struggle with the most in trying to fit in? What is it that you do that you know you shouldn't do just because you want to fit in? Clothes, sex of shopping, drinking, cars, your actions. You've got to figure that out for yourself. You need to ask yourself these deep, soul-searching kind of questions. What's the one area that you struggle with the most trying to fit in? Here's another question. When is the time that I put my happiness above God's call for my holiness? Well, God doesn't care. He just wants me to be happy. No. God wants you to be holy. Happiness is a byproduct of holiness. Get the holiness down first. Maybe here's a question that you have to search yourself for. What are the biggest ways that I'm different from the world and everybody around me? Is there a difference in me? If you're a follower of Jesus, there should be something that is different than anybody else around you. Your light should shine. Your life should be an example. Is there anything different in your life? Here's a big one. What's the area that God wants me to be different in? Whew. Think about your life. Think about the people that you influence. Think about the people that, 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 that are going to see you live in a certain way and maybe find Jesus because of those actions. Peter says this to these hurting Christians, 1 Peter 1.18. He says, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. My prayer for you today is that the Spirit of God would do an incredible thing in your life. And that is to show any area of your life that needs to change. My prayer is that God opens up those thoughts to you, that God reveals those things to you that need to change. And guys, we've all got something that needs to change. May God reveal that to you. God is calling you to raise the standard, to make a change, to be different, because you're not like everyone else. So quit living like everyone else. Hold on to that thought. Hold on to the challenge. Hold on to Jesus. Will you pray with me, please? Father God, I'm praying over everyone that's watching this morning. God, whether you're watching at 12 o'clock in the morning or whether maybe it's three o'clock in the afternoon, God, I'm just praying for them that you open up their minds and their hearts and their souls to what they need to do to live an exceptional life, to be different than everyone around them and to do it for you 
in your kingdom. God, I pray for them to make a difference. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take time now to celebrate communion together. And we do that every week because, well, it's an important thing for us to stop and remember what Jesus did for us and what he's doing with us and through us. And now might be the perfect time for you to sit and think about some of the answers to those really tough questions that Scott just threw at us. You know, what, what is making us different? How can we be different? How can we stand out? So while we eat the bread and drink the juice to remind us of Jesus' body and his love for us, take this time and think about those things. Let's celebrate together.
You guys, thanks for joining us today. We are so glad that you were here with us. And we pray that you have an exceptionally blessed week. Go out, make a difference in this world, and we'll see you back here next Sunday.